you know, and I think what a lot of problems with startup companies is that they that they don't get the UPC on their packaging or on their product, right? They but they have all this inventory. Well, that you those UPCs and uh, different SKUs, you know, provide inventory control, right? And for these larger companies, so if you're looking to go to scale with your product, um, then you need you need to have it ready for them to to for them to have the product, right? That was Ken Andres getting us prepared for the next big outdoor show, IFTD, ICAST, The Shot Show, and more today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you get a chance, please take a moment and leave us a five-star review if you've been listening to the show uh, in the past. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash L-O-V-E. Love. Love is the answer. Uh, you get, uh, if you want to do this, uh, I'll send you out a free wet fly swing hat if you just send me a screenshot. So uh, shoot me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com if you have a chance to do that. Ken Andres from AFTA is here to walk us through some of the steps of growing your brand through uh, many uh, of the big outdoor shows we talk about today that he's been involved with. We get some tips to find success at IFTD this year. We find out why he moved into AFTA after leading at some of the largest gun and fishing shows uh, in the world. And also some killer short stories about some companies that started out in 10 by 10 booths and, uh, and now are some of the biggest and best companies today. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsor. Tokens Fly Shop, providing superior products at an affordable price. An amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fishing accessories. Since 2005, Tokens has been over delivering on price, service, and passion. And now it's time to discover the Tokens buzz for yourself. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Tokens to get started today. You support this podcast by clicking over to take a look at Tokens online. That's wetflyswing.com slash Tokens. T-O-G-E-N-S. Tokens. Let's get this one rolling. So without further ado, here is Ken Andres from AFTA.org. How's it going, Ken? Great, Dave. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for making the time uh, today to put this together. We're... We, uh, we talked about AFTA in IFTD a while back. I think this was right when COVID got going. I had uh, Matt Smythe on and, and Tom Sadler, I think, in another episode. Um, today, there's been some changes at AFTA. We're going to talk about that. But, you know, I also want to focus on maybe a little bit on where we're at with COVID. So, um, yeah, man, how, how are things going? You know, as COVID aside, I think, you know, it's, it, the show's coming along well. Um, you know, the association's really been putting, you know, a lot of effort into trying to uh, keep the show going and and meet the uh, needs of the membership and you know the I think the membership has kind of really responded and said hey we we want to get together safely as possible but we definitely want to get together and just for those I, there might be some people listening that don't know exactly after IFTD that maybe aren't a company uh, maybe just give us the little uh, minute or whatever elevator pitch on on AFTA IFT uh, what, what what it's about sure you know AFTA is the trade organization that represents uh, the fly fishing industry and IFTD is an international fly tackle dealers uh, show. Uh, it's a business to business trade show uh, that uh, that is hosted by AFTA. So uh, all the largest brands and small to the smallest brands, uh, startups that are in fly and uh, retailers and guides and media are all invited to to join us. Yeah, there you go. And, and I was there the last one, I think, that was live in, uh, I guess it was 2019. And uh, and it was it was great. I mean, definitely made some connections there with people that, um, you know, it was a huge because I think that's the networking piece. Do you find that that is, I mean, what do you think is the biggest value for people like a company, a fly fishing company that's listening right now, if they're on the fence about going to, to, going to IFTD or getting involved in AFTA? What's the biggest benefit to IFTD? Well, I think for a manufacturer, I think what's important is getting in front of your customer. You know, I think uh, manufacturers reps do a lot of the work, you know, in this industry to to represent the brand and bring it to dealers. But, you know, as far as that direct connection with manufacturers and dealers, you know, the show really provides that platform. Um, so also for retailers, it gives them an opportunity to find out 
new products, you know? So if there's multiple stores in a singular location, um, they're not all carrying the same brands, right? They, they get, they can kind of come in and see what's new and what's, uh, interesting and, uh, cater their product, uh, lineup to their customers. Yeah. Right. There, there you go. So that's, and if you're thinking, let's take, for example, like a, a small fly rod company, you know, that's out there, that's, that's trying to build this, their brand. So they, they go there and they, they connect with potentially some shops or whoever else that might be able to, to sell. Is that, is that kind of what it's about? Yeah. And it, and it, it, there's a, there's a ease in which you can do that. Right. I think kind of the thought behind it is, um, if you're a small startup company and you're looking to introduce your brand to the industry, um, the, you know, setting up a booth in the, in the, the world's largest uh, fly fishing trade show, um, is a great way to start, you know, and, and setting up appointments with, with dealers, uh, either within your area or throughout the country. And, you know, pre COVID we were international show. Um, so you really have all eyes from all corners of the globe, um, that you can put on your product at the show and without, and I think there's, <laughs> there's a lot of people say, Hey, you know, I can just kind of jump in my van and drive a sprinter van and drive all of them down the East coast. Well, you know, those, th- those things cost a lot of money, right. And time and, and to be able to do it over three days and set up those appointments and, and, and show rate sheets and, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, purchasing power there at the show. I think it's, I think that's really the benefit of doing a uh, trade show. And is it good? That, so you mentioned setting up appointments. Is that the best way if you're going there and you have, I mean, obviously you have a limited amount of time. I remember last time I was there, you know, I, you're there for the full time, but it's hard to get around to everybody and you right. obviously can't meet with everybody. So what do you recommend? Do you recommend setting up appointments through the schedule things? 100%. I mean, there, there's no question that, um, there was a time, and I think that probably earlier in two-step distribution, or you know, even before that, um, that uh, exhibitors or manufacturers would just set up their sh- their their booth and wait for people kind of come around, you know, and they just kind of set their their day based on how popular their brand was. And um, the smarter exhibitors here, and I've been pushing this now for the last you know twenty years, or 15 years in the, in the, within the fishing industry, um, and running shows is that if you can set up appointments and know that you have those appointments before the show, you're guaranteeing yourself business, right? Whether they buy or not is one thing, but at least you're there and saying, Hey, I've got this many exi- um, appointments on Wednesday. I've got this many appointments on Thursday and say, Hey, you know, instead of just saying, Hey, I've got the best product. I'm going to set up my shop. And people are just going to drive by or walk by and, and discover me. That's those days are long gone. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> marketing is marketing's become. You can be the best salesperson in the world, but marketing has become the most important part of these B two B two events. Well, let's let's start first with the people. So you you mentioned connecting with brands. How do you know who's going to be there and who you might connect with? So it, as a, for a manufacturer who's exhibiting at IFTD, um, you know, they'll have their current client list and prospective client list. And we ask that they invite them to the show um, and set up appointments with them. Uh, we have a pre-registered attendee list, you know, people who register to attend the show. Um, and I pull that list about a month before the, the show. So sometime in mid-September, um, I'll pull the uh, attendee list. And I'll send that list um, to exhibitors uh, to say, hey, you know, these guys are signed up to to attend, and this is all; these are all retailers, and so if and media, um, because you guys are important too, uh, and so then they can reach out and communicate to them. Now, this is an this is an opt out list, so it's not the full list. Um, so you know, if a registrant says, hey, you know, I don't want to be contacted. That's that's an option for them, but this list at least helps them communicate with and know who's going to be there, and maybe they missed in their when they're throwing their their net um, to uh, capture as many retailers as possible. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so that's it. So basically, check back. Probably this will be on the website in mid September. Is that where it will be? Or 
Yeah, it'll be a direct communication to the exhibitors. Yeah. Okay. So if you and then I guess to be exhibited, so you need to sign up to get uh, connected to that. Is that how, how do you uh, go about? Is that is that true? Do you have to sign up to kind of take a look at that list? And then what would you recommend? Talk about the sign up process because I know you have AFTA and you have IFTD. How does that all work? So so in order to exhibit, you do have to be a member of AFTA, and you know we'll, we can talk about that you know later. But in order to exhibit, uh, you would have to reach out to th- there's there's uh, information on the website. It asks to contact me, um, Kenneth Andres, uh, and then the email is iftd at afta.org. Uh, and then basically what I would do is communicate directly with the, with the potential exhibitor and find out what their needs are, because not everybody's needs are the same, right? And so if I hear, oh, I'm looking to connect with, you know, as many consumers as possible, I'm going to be like, eh, this is not a show for you because this is a business to business trade show, right? We're, we, we were asking you to, to come in and display your product and sell it by the pallet or by volume, uh, not by the piece, you know, and, and certainly there won't be any consumers there at the show uh, to disrupt that, that, that business. Um, so really, I think the most important part of the sales process for, for IFTD is that connectivity and understanding uh, sitting down, and I always say this, and it's probably been mentioned before, but you know, I see myself as a fiduciary um, when I when I when I sit down and talk to an exhibitor. And all of these conversations are obviously um, private. Um, and so, if hey, this is your goal, let's see what we can do to to help that. It's not just about selling boost space; it's about selling the idea that hey, we can connect you with this amount of exhibitors or looking at the retailer demographic, these are the guys that you're looking for. We have a high percentage of that, right? So th- that's what we're hoping to see. And, you know, and if you're looking to get, you know, an, you know, October is a great time for open to buy or on-demand purchasing too, right? So it's kind of end of the year. Uh, it's kind of a little bit later than um, for the preview um, for the following year, but open to buy and on-demand products are there. Um, I think it's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways to, to, to have this conversation. So what, what is open to buy and on demand? What are those products? So those are typically manufacturers have products in their material handling racks that they, Hey, this is kind of end of the year, you know, we're trying to get unload this so that we can get the new product, make space for new products. Gotcha. Right. And so that, so that is something that's, um, that's also an opportunity for retailers as well. And I think, you know, you, you can find some pretty good deals without having to talk about show specials or anything like that. I think the connectivity on the show floor, I think a light goes off with retailers and maybe exhibitors sometimes too that might forget, hey, you know, this is so expensive, you know, can't, I'm not, you know, we, we're not sure we want to do this anymore. And then all of a sudden that connection happens, right? And so they start to move some product and it's like, okay, this was a good idea. So every year we have to make sure that we show value to exhibitors and to retailers. Uh, and that's, that's the way to do it. That's it. And then, so going back to that rod example, the small rod company there, you know, they make it there and then they connect with, uh, you know, it could be a fly shop or I mean another whatever there. And then they make a good, like a personal connection all of a sudden that, that company is selling their products, selling their rods, and, and maybe is their best retailer in the country. Is that kind of how it could work? Yeah, and you know, so that and so that's and that's a part of it. It's like so then so then they meet a retailer that's interested in their product. You know, that might not they might not ever stumble upon their website or their e-commerce site um, prior to the prior to the show, but they they get to talk to them and then they say, hey, you know, I'm Dave Stewart from you know I have a podcast. You know, what do you do? And all of a sudden. Now that now they've got you know a forum, uh, a virtual forum, right, and uh, uh, and so they get some editorial, you know, and they get to talk about their product, and so those connective points are all there. And I think to think about trade shows or um, events like this in a singular purpose is de- is is not the way to look at it because trade shows have changed so much. Most of the shows that you know I've been running or been a part of have become more media shows, right? People still buying, but they've become more media shows. And so promotion is really kind of the big thing in promoting product. 
There you go. Well, there's a ton here, obviously, with IFTD and, and AFTA we could dig into. Um, let, let's. I want to circle back. You've been mentioned the, some of your time in the industry and some other space. Talk about, I want to talk here about where else you've been. So bring us back. Let, let's go right back to the first, the start of this on, on the fishing. How long, or not how long, but how did you get into fly fishing? And then talk about your other industry jobs that you've done. Yeah, so um, my first foray into the to fly fishing was at the Orvis corporate store in Roanoke, Virginia, which is if any of you have ever purchased anything from Orvis that mostly probably gets shipped out of Blue Hills, Virginia, uh, Blue Hills, or, which is in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, so they had a corporate store downtown and I, you know, I had a great time there, uh, working through college and high school and, you know, had a great mentor there and, you know, really kind of learned the ins and outs of, freshwater and saltwater fly fishing. And so, you know, moved through college, I, you know, worked a bunch of forest stores and guided throughout the South, the Southeast. And, um, you know, it wasn't really, I ended up in Charleston, you know, and I was, I was working for a fly shop there in Charleston. That's no more, but, um, I, you know, met a friend whose dad ran trade shows. <laughs> and so after college he decided, Hey, you want, do you want to come down and you know, work on a trade show. I said, I don't know what a trade show is. I'm sure I'll do that. And, you know, I'm 20 years old and don't have a job. So I was just uh, thinking this is going to be a great opportunity and ended up being the best decision of my life. And I have found um, trade shows to be the most rewarding experience, um, you know, that I get to use all sorts of different faculties, sales, operations, marketing, kind of, you know, understanding, trying to understand you know, hu the human experience and bring large groups of people together and, and kind of, you know, funneling them into the right rooms. Right. And so uh, long story short, you know, I did that for a while. It's a uh, tile and stone show, international tile and stone shows, about a million square feet. And then um, it moved to D.C. And, and was working for a decorator there or a general show contractor in the trade show industry. And I popped this this opportunity with the American Sport Fishing Association, and uh, I said uh, I said I went in for the interview, and they said I'll, I'll never forget this because Mike Nussman and I sat down in the room. I had interviewed with uh, with the show director, and he said he goes uh, he goes uh, he goes we love you. I think we think you're great, uh, but we can't afford you. Huh. I said. I said, nope, you can afford me. I go, this is like a dream job. I, I definitely want to do this. And so we, we negotiated a, a salary, and, and I was there for nine years. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, and ran ICAST until 2016. And so uh, that was, which is a great experience. And, you know, when I got there, you know, it was two-step distribution. It was a lot of older guys with blue blazers and briefcases. We were in Las Vegas Convention Center. And it was a, you know, the show would open, you'd never know it, right? It was, you know, and so yeah, I'm looking around and there's like carbon paper and people writing down stuff. And I said, man, this is a fishing industry show. It's like, well, this should be bigger. And I look at SHOT Show and I'm like, SHOT Show's got, you know, 20, 30,000 people. I said, we, we, we're the number four sport in the country, aside behind hiking and walking, right? That's fishing. In general yeah fishing correct yeah and so i'm thinking man we should just do something so when i was able to take over the show um and really kind of put my hands on it we changed up a lot of things and so uh lo and behold 2000 we moved the show to orlando you know we start to grow the show went from 7,000 total attendance to 15,000. um at that point you know i kind of was like i've done a lot here i kind of want to i, I have this if, if you know me or those of you that do, uh, you know, I, I have this once I get going with this stuff, I, I get really kind of passionate about it and want to learn more. And so Emerald Expositions called and asked me to help them with uh, Surf Expo. Um, so I went worked with Surf Expo, uh, learned the water sport industry. That was the water skiing, surf, uh, paddle sports. And I said, hey, wow, everything, that, it just kind of blew my mind. It's like everything that I knew, thought I knew about trade shows and fishing, um, you know, we're just kind of blown away. And so created a new uh, category for them called Blue Water, uh, which is fishing related, 
products. Um, and, and of course, just like anything else. And I don't know if uh, what it is about me, but sometimes people just like, hey, you know, I think we want you on our team. And <laughs> so the NSSF uh, called and reached out and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in working with the firearms industry for SHOT Show? And I thought, this is it. Like, you know, this is, I've made it. You know, this is where, I, you know, my career, I, this is where I want to be. And so I went there to NSSF, but it didn't last long. And the, I'll tell you that the firearms industry, and I, and I hunt and, you know, shoot and do all those things. Uh, it's, it's a different, it's a different deal. Yeah, yeah. I'd imagine well, and just just quickly, Ken, I just um, just because I, I want to make sure we stay the the shot show. Just before you go, what what is that? Is that a um, can you is that an acronym or can you describe that again? What's the shot? Yeah, shot. Yeah, shot show is the uh, is the trade show, the B two B trade show for uh, for the for the firearms industry. Oh, there um, you go. So that's it. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. So it would be uh, for the fishing industry. It's ICAST for uh, uh, the yep. gun industry. Right. It's uh, it's shot gotcha, show. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so um, I didn't, I, I kind of went there for a little bit and then we just decided that that wasn't for me and it, it's fine. It's, it was, it's, I, all of this is a great experience, right? For me, I'm still, and I'm building up to where I am now. I uh, went back to Emerald for a little bit and ran an e-com, um, ran sales for an e-com show back at Emerald. Uh, and uh, Ben Bulis and I, who are close friends, still to this day, obviously, um, he put me on the board for AFTA and, uh, and, uh, and he became chairman of the show committee and, it, uh, you know, and then, you know, Ben and Matt decided that they were moving on and the board asked me to see if I could help them with the uh, show, which has always been a dream of mine at when I was at ASA, you know, I've always wanted to be a part of AFTA and the co-location with AFTA or IFTD and, and ICAST, you know, it was the, the people in that room, you know, were, uh, there was a lot of people involved in that, but, um, you know, just kind of like, man, I, I really just want to be a part of, <laughs> I want to be a part of AFTA because like my beginnings in fishing were in fly. Oh, gotcha. Know? Even though you're coming down from the larger, much larger industries of fishing and hunting uh, guns, you, you know, to this tiny fly fishing niche, it, it's it's kind of your ultimate goal because that's what your almost your true passion, your true love is. Correct, and and I th- and I think that was well illustrated in that. You know, it's like I I want to be a part of something where I have a tribe and I have people that think like me, or you know, who who maybe came up at the same era where if you didn't use a dry fly. You know, you and you didn't tell anybody where you went. Um, then that was okay, right? You had I had a lot of my mentors were or were older, 60, 70 year old uh, men, and they wouldn't tell me where to go. <laughs> you know, I had to learn that. Now you go online, and and they not only tell you where to go, they tell you what knots to use and what flies to use and what week and what what water temperature. And it's a completely different industry now, and information's passed a lot differently. But yeah, no, I I'm. I've always identified as a fly fisherman. Yes, that's awesome. So yeah, that gives us a little snippet. I'm sure we left out some some good stories along the way. But I'm curious on just uh, quickly on ICAST, IFTD. You know, it sounds like you were the one that you were there when that was uh, together as one. And I, I didn't make it down to ICAST uh, when it was as one. But why was the split? Because now IFTD is back to Denver. Do you know how that went down or why that is? Well, so initially, I think I think you have to go look back at history, and I think. Uh, the the downturn. So IFTD uh, stood at the time. Um, well, actually started in 2011, I believe. Right. So uh, it was actually Emerald Expositions that ran uh, fly fishing retailer, um, and it was about 2010 or 2000. Right. I think the economy kind of went down, and um, the show kind of was going down, and there was you know there was a lot of uh, questions about what the show was going to, what was going to happen to the show. And so Emerald let the show go. Uh, thus was born IFTD um, in 11 and 12. So I think they were in Reno and New Orleans and it, and it just didn't level off. Right. And so um, part of our conversations with ASA, myself, Mike Nussman, um, again, there's going to be a lot of other players, but the initial, the initial meeting was Mike Nussman and myself, uh, ben Bulis, Jim Klug from Yellow Dog, and, and Casey Walsh from 
uh, Sims. And we, we met in Bozeman for three days. I will say that we spent more time on the water, but, this, <laughs> but it was okay, right? We did, but we did spend a lot of time in, in meeting rooms uh, over those three days to decide, hey, you know, how is this going to look and what's this going to look like? And, um, and I think, um, it, you know, it, it, just, it just made sense. We were better together then, right, so than apart. And uh, having fly big, be a big part of, of – uh, the the larger fishing industry, I think, was always a great um, something a conversation that's always been been had. Not I I I will have to uh, mention that Randy Swisher was a part of that back then too. So uh, he I think he was running the show. Anyway, long story short, we move on. We have a great relationship. I left in 2016, um, and the show was getting stronger and stronger. I think part of the pushback was one was that. F- or ICAST was in Orlando. And so um, they were itching to move the show back. Uh, you know, Fly's always been a, in the front range, right? And so move it back to Denver. We, we, I went with Tucker Ladd at the time, who was a chairman of AFTA, to Denver to kind of walk the space and kind of take a look at it. And, uh, you know, I was just like, man, I don't know. I just can't fit in, in Denver. Um, so, the, so, they were, so they were itching, AFTA was already itching to, to move the show and so um, to meet its membership needs. Yeah. So then I think just once I left, I think the, the decision, you know, to kind of move back with that momentum um, to uh, Denver in 2019 was a great one for them because it was not only the largest show, I mean, the most, you know, most attended show. I mean, it was it was like, hey, we're coming home and. You know, it was, it was it was a great event. So yep, it was it was. So it just basically made it easier for even though there's obviously fly fishing companies all over the world. You know, the Denver or wherever, just that west, intermountain west sort of thing is just easier for people. Just it's kind of right. like there's a. I mean, I guess that is like Colorado is known. I'm not sure where you know per capita numbers of fly shops, but it's definitely a hot spot. And and Salt Lake is a great place too. Obviously, lots of uh, yeah yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's the same math that ICAST used for you know for Florida. You know, as being moving to with us moving the show to Orlando, it's the number one fishing state in the country, right? And if you break that, if you break that down to fly fishing, I mean, you 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 only have to think shortly about the idea or that or know that um, the West is where fly fishing king is king. You know, so gotcha. okay, um, cool. Well, that's a good little summary, and I want to dig in just a little bit here onto some of the shows. And you know, you mentioned some of them, like so. So you've got IFTD, you've got the, the things you mentioned, the other ones, which were the um, obviously ICAST is the big one. Are there other um, shows out there that are either for kind of industry people or the public that you would recommend that be good places for, say, like I said, that that company, say that fly rod company, that small company, to go yeah. to find either retailers or other uh, consumers. Yeah, so part part of my my business plan when I sit down with I talk to an exhibitor and they say they're brand new, I, I said, you know, the first thing you kind of want to do is create demand and you test it in your market, right? And so uh, Ben Frinsky shows and Chuck Frinsky, obviously the Frinsky shows have been a great like, you know, testing spot for a lot of those brands. And so if, if you can sell your fly rods in your backyard, right, it's going to be a lot easier to sell it um, across the country. And um, and internationally, so yeah, fly fishing shows are yep. are a fantastic place to say, hey, um, let's uh, let's see how this uh, how our products do. Yeah, perfect. So and that's the, and I'm not sure what they have going. Obviously, we st- we're still in the COVID thing, and as we speak, I think you know, depending on which state you're in, I mean, things are some new strain and stuff like that. I guess I guess before we dig more into that list that I'm kind of thinking of, um, just touching on COVID for a second. Um, so we've got this thing coming up. I mean, th- I, there's conferences are back and things like that. But how are you guys hedging your bets on if something crazy happens? Are you not even thinking about that? Just go full steam ahead with the in-person conference. Yeah. Well, you know, crazy has already happened. Yeah. Right. And I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think I got an email the other day saying, "Hey, you know, what is AFTA doing?" And and I, you know, it's, it's, we're not burying our head in the sand. I think everybody's very well aware of AFTA. I mean, of, of COVID. And, and apps is no different. And so what I think what we're trying to do is to come up with with good, reasonable information, right, and timely. If 
timely information for our exhibitors and attendees, and we're crafting that 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 narrative right now. And um, I think part of the issue is, is that this thing's changing like daily, right? Um, if you look at the State Department or CDC guidance on on you know COVID and flights from international flights and these kinds of things, it's changed. You know, restrictions have changed, and so. Um, what we're trying to do is to put something up that's intelligible, that makes sense, um, and come up with, you know, a, hey, you know, these are kind of what we're asking you to do or, or we're not asking you to do or what have you uh, that is going to meet the needs and, and the safety of our of our attendees. So, yes, I mean, COVID's at the forefront of our of our mind and and uh, we're, we're going to come up with a good safety plan. We already have we already have safety plans in place. I have. Uh, when I put the built the show floor um, back in March, uh, I think February or March, uh, you know, we did one way entrances, one one way exits. You know, we have kind of like this filtering of 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 uh, of, of space um, and usage of space. So it's kind of open. Uh, it's it's an intimate floor plan uh, only because by design it's. It's still kind of open and flow, but it's open and flowy, right? Uh, so you'll you don't feel like you're just in an echo chamber, right? No. <laughs> and people can probably choose. Uh, you know, I I've heard some of the conferences that have been successful. People have liked other ones where. You know, during COVID where they've got like some of them, I heard things that, like name tags are like, okay, you know, I, you can hug me or stay away from, you know what I mean? So people know yeah. right away. And then there's space, like, you know, you, if you're yes. sitting down, you don't have to sit right next to somebody. There's actually open spaces. Is that stuff you guys are thinking about? Yeah, of course. And I think the, the big thing here is that um, we want everybody to feel safe. Um, we do, we're going to have a lot of signage there, you know, reminding people that we are still in a pandemic. Um, and that there are things that, you know, hey, you, for the last three months, things were pretty good, weren't they? I mean, I think that we got there through, you know, social distancing, washing our hands and, you know, and maybe wearing a mask, you know, and, and until those mandates change, you know, uh, or there are those are those uh, those guidelines change from CDC, we'll follow them. But not only federally, but, you know, local and state are sometimes more restrictive. And so that's kind of really where we're getting our guidance from in Salt Lake and Utah as well. That's right. Yeah. And and just so people know right now, it's August, 2021. So we're, we're kind of like a year and a half into COVID, right? This is, this is, we've all been dealing with this this madness. So, okay. Well, that gives us a little, uh, you know, and obviously you guys are going to do a great job getting that prepared. Um, so I want to just uh, go back to that list again. You mentioned, we've talked about IFTD, the Fremsky shows shot, iCast. There's also like the outdoor retailer. Have you ever been a part of that or know about that show? Yeah. So outdoor is also produced by Emerald Expositions and uh, same group that produced the fly fishing retailer show. Um, and OR is great. I love the, I love that group. You know, um, they're they're some of my best friends, and um, we've always championed OR and uh, been going to OR for a very long time, uh, both as an Emerald employee, but before then as well. And um, they've always got what, what's great about OR is that they're they're so on the cutting edge and on the front of education, co- educational content, right? They they the, those attendees and exhibitors that have a thirst for knowledge will not be um, denied. I mean, they're going to get as much information as they can at OR, and I think they do a very good job with that. And working with OIA as well, obviously, as, a, as, a, as an association, and, and it's been great. It's a great show. And is there, are there other uh, conferences, just to wrap this up, uh, that are kind of industry-type events out there that we haven't noted that are kind of related or connected to fishing or outdoors? Yeah, you know, so there have there are other there are other shows, and I'll be honest with you, there, there's so many of them uh, local that it's like uh, you know we could talk about Schaumburg and and you know uh, the Northeast shows. These are like local expo, like even out like in the West, you've got the um, you know whatever you call those shows. There, there's yeah, there's outdoor shows that that go to you know kind of the Western states as well. So there's all those are all over the country. Yeah, and, and depending on what vertical you're in, you know, it, there could be an outdoor show, but it just really kind of my, my world's really been in the fishing and hunting space. And so, you know, you have the the, um, the, the outdoor expo shows in the Northeast and, 
you know, and in the Midwest and, and, you know, there's a lot of Western shows that are, that are consumer driven, right? So uh, those are all very good, you know, places. And I'll be honest with you, if anybody has questions about those, any of your listeners, you know, they can email me at IFTD at AFTA.org and I'd be glad to help them find something. Okay. Yeah. There's tons of that stuff out there. All right. So that's, that's good. Well, I feel like, I mean, anything else to know as we're getting prepared? Somebody's again thinking about heading to IFTD um, after. Do you want to talk a little bit about how, you know, again, going back to that signing up, how that all works? Yeah. No. So, again, so we, if, you, if you're interested in exhibiting, you can reach out to me and we'll sit down. And um, I always kind of like to sit down and look at the plan. Yeah. So you do an individual, like a consultation, you kind of sit down and actually, yeah, what, each company you walk in and describe and, and see how you can customize it for them. That's correct. That's great. That's great service. Yeah, it is. It's, but it's important though, because not everybody wants to get up there and just sell product, right? They kind of want to, they want some, just want to promote their product. Some people don't have the ability to deliver product, but they, you know, they want to say, uh, they, or they won't be able to deliver product you know, right away. And, and so at those, at that point, I sit there and talk to them about when do you, when do you think that you'll have product ready and available? Uh, because if you just come with a prototype and the world likes it, right. Then all of a sudden you, they're going to ask you for deliverables and you're going to be like, well, it's going to be about six months. And they're they're, they're going to just be like, nope, cancel my order. And so these are all pitfalls that I, I that I can help with. I don't know everything, Believe me, I, I know enough to be dangerous, but I, but I've been doing this long enough where I just say, hey, look, you got a prototype. The last thing you want to do is to put a prototype on a table and the guy picks it up and it breaks because it was a display and it's happened time and time again. Um, I had one guy and I'll, and I'll say this real quick is he won best best new product um, for freshwater rods. It was camo rods. It was incredible. The, the, you know, the action and everything else and i think something happened with his container and he lost like i mean millions of dollars in you know in sales and i just i felt so bad for him you know just you know it's like um i just i I don't maybe and i I think there was something more than that but in any case you just you just want to be be ready to be ready to deliver product when you're ready to when you're ready to come to the show. You're right, and and so and being ready, like you said, for that example, how do you determine that? I mean, is that something just a feel to know how many of that product, if you've got a new product, how many that you know they're going to need? Well, I well first they would just obviously just bring a display, but they would I'd say hey look, get your pricing in order, right? If you've got retail pricing, you got um, wholesale pricing, uh, and know your quantities, right, and know SKUs. You know, and I think what a lot of problems with startup companies is that they that they don't get the UPC on their packaging or on their product, right? They but they have all this inventory. Well, that you those UPCs and uh, different SKUs, you know, provide inventory control, right? And for these larger companies, so if you're looking to go to scale with your product, um, then you need you need to have it ready for them to to for them to have the product, right? Um, yeah, no, I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways of to, to, yeah, a lot of, a lot of different things that I think a lot of people just don't think about, but this, what's great is that they're, they're, these people are like the ingenuity, right? That there's, this is the new product that, Hey, I thought about the way these clippers work. I'm going to try this and let's see it. You know, it, that's what you see, these smaller 10 by 10s. And that's always been my focus is to develop smaller companies, the big guys. Yeah, they're good uh, to go. They're good to go. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and it's just kind of like saying, hey, look, you know, we're going to kind of give you we want to make sure that you're happy. Yeah. And they're there, obviously. Yeah. I remember last year in 2019, I mean, like Patagonia, you know, had a giant yeah. booth, you know, all, all the big companies, they had some giant booths. But, yeah, there were everybody else that was sprout. Would you say it's more it's kind of an even distribution of the small, you know, uh, small one man operations versus the bigger companies? Um, I think. The, the disparity is that there's less larger companies and a lot of a lot more oh, smaller companies. Oh, there are. Companies. There's a lot of smaller companies. Right, right. Smaller to midsize, and and I don't want to make smaller companies sound like they're they're less significant because those are the most significant parts of the show, right? And it it can be overlooked by show organizers. It can be overlooked by large manufacturers. But the reality is is that these shows have been built 
with with small companies in mind because without that innovation without these guys saying hey i instead of opening up a restaurant i'm going to i'm going to go and and create a fly or i'm going to go you know i'm going to put my money into the fly industry and try to build this product and so if we can give them that form that's what these events are for that's what you know from the ferenskis to iftd the the, the conduits that kind of race back and forth between the two are just in is, is to propel product innovation by right? in branding. Um, and it's like, it's just, it's so cool just to see a lot of some of the larger brands that you see in the conventional industry that I, I saw come through and as a 10 by 10. Oh, really? So, now, so by 10 by 10, you mean they're, they're starting out, they're a tiny little one man operation at the start. The first time I'll, I'll share the story with you and, and your listeners. The first time I talked to um, Yeti, oh right, was back. Yeah, so the, I think it was like 2009 or eight. I can't remember. I, I think it was nine, to be honest with you. Um, uh, maybe it was ten. But in any case, I, I can't remember. It, but they said, "Hey, you know, we want a booth." My good friend Will Morgan says, "We want a booth." Uh, you know. 10 by 10. And I said, Hey, we, you know, we can certainly do that. Tell me what about your product? He said, well, we're going to sell $400 coolers. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I started laughing. I said, I go, man, I, you're going to need all the help you can get. I go, and, and we had some familiar, um, uh, fr- with similar friends and backgrounds. And so, you know, I said, Hey, look, we'll put you on the main aisle over here. So that in that year, the following year, they took a 10 by 20 and they stuck it with a 10 by 20 for a while. But from that point on, you see how they grew, right? With a with a with a great marketing plan. They didn't come in big with a twenty by sixty. They didn't come, you know. They just hit. Hey, this is where we are right now. Um, we we they built that relate those relationships in the, within the fishing industry, and it just took off. It's it's it is one of the coolest things to see. I mean, uh, Z awesome. man, I. Yeah, I mean all of all of those guys. It's just it's great, and I've seen a lot of those as well. That's what's exciting about. It. That's what I love about going to the show is connecting with some of these companies and people that I've talked to like this, you know. And hopefully, I'll I'll, yeah. I'll connect with you as well. But you know, Turtle Box Audio, I'll give a shout out to them. They're they mentioned the Yeti story, and they're a big inspiration for them. But I think they're you know a smaller company now. I think it's a, and they're trying to grow that play. And I could see them becoming a leader in the world and what they do. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're doing awesome. And, uh, so yeah, I, I hear you. I think it's, it's, I think it's the, the stories obviously are huge and that's probably how Yeti has, um, part of their marketing, right. That's a big part of how they've grown. Yeah. And, and they, and they, and they recognize it say, Hey, we're on to something here with our marketing and this is what we need to do. And they continue to do that, uh, to this day. And it's, there's still some of my closest friends and they've kind of, folks have kind of come and gone from there, but they've always kind of, someone else has always stepped up. And so with turtle box, you know, we've got, you know, have a call with them this week. Oh, and cool. so they've reached out. Yeah. So I mean, th- that's this, that's where it is, right. This kind of filtration to like, Hey, we're, let's find out what you want, what you're looking for. We can help you build a plan and design. It's not an overnight thing, right? This is a three to five year uh, plan. But if you're willing to invest in us, we're going to invest in you and get to try to deliver you the best business to business forum that we can. And, you know, and who's to, who's to know what's going to happen in the future? Maybe consumers will be included. But, you know, that's kind of the way things are going yeah. now. But we'll see. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And obviously there's some people right now listening who are consumers and are you know, listening because they listen to most of the episodes. And, uh, you know, I guess for them, when you think of consumers, I mean, the, the Ferimsky is probably the best um, show. If they want to find these new products, is that is that the best place to go to figure out what's what's new and, and coming? Or what would you recommend if it's a consumer that's actually listening right now? Yeah, I would I would look for a, a fly fishing show in, in your area. You know, um, Chuck's been doing this, has done this for a very long time. And Ben's taken over and, and they've continued to, you know, he's innovated that show and, and darn COVID got a, kind of got in the way. Uh, I, I know that they found a new location in Denver, um, which I think is the Gaylord um, it, for Denver next year. So, you know, hey, you, this is all great. There, the, the thing is, is that no one show or industry is going to be the silver bullet, right? Is, is there that magic bullet? that you have to network these things. No, it's not about one person. It's not just, a, it's not about me or, or Dave Stewart. 
It's about just the collective group and this, and this, Hey, we're, you're in this, we're going to put you in the bubble. And if you need help, just ask and we'll, we'll be, we'll, we'll be able to help guide you in the right direction, but comp- competition within the association, everybody takes their hat off and puts the association hat on. And, and, uh, it's just, Hey, let's, let's get, let's get fly fishing moving. That's it. And networking. I'm glad you came back to that. that that's an old word. And sometimes maybe people don't like the word. I kind of like it. Networking. It always seems positive yeah. to me. Like you're just basically building good relationships and friendships. So is there anything else on that networking piece? Again, you're talking about the, we're talking about the shows, but you know, if that company wants to get out more to the world, is there any other networking tips you would give anybody listening now as we wrap this up? Well, you know, it, it, the world's changed so much, and I've I've been stuck in a concrete building for the last twenty years, right? What what I have seen is that marketing today is so much different. You know, where marketing manufacturers used to, you know, help retailers market their product uh, through you know advertising, you know, magazines and whatnot. Now you see on social media manufacturers pushing their product direct to consumer. Uh, we haven't really kind of talked to D2C yet, and I think that's kind of a scary place for for retailers, but it really shouldn't be because I feel like the what what Gen Z and millennials want is the experience, right? And even though Amazon can guarantee next day shipping, there's nothing like going into a shop and buying and touching and or feeling and touching and trying out the product and buying right there. I I'll be honest with you. A lot of these kids are 25 and 27 years old that are buying G3 waders and boots. I could never have done that, you know, and went back in the day, not without a pro deal, but these guys are just going in and buying it. Right. And so it's that there, I think we need to embrace that. Hey, we're not, we can't repel direct to consumer. I think that's, it's already here as a, as a retailer, but we can embrace it. And I think manufacturers are doing a great job of, of promoting the product and then also driving them those consumers to retail shops. Right. And so that's, that's kind of really where if, if I'm, if I'm talking to um, about marketing or promoting my product and building my brand, you know, use of social media is obviously the platform um, finding out. I mean, you, there are, there are things that you can get off the, off the internet about demographics that will scare you to death. Right. They'll know what you click throughs and all of these things. But that that data is kind of important. Right. And so whether you use your 12 year old son to build your website or you hire <laughs> a 25 year old, you know, yep. that's out of college, they can do it. Mine that data and, and be smart about it. And, you know, it's no longer can fly shops are one of the last places. And I love this. I love this about the fly industry is that we as associates in those fly shops know just as much as these uh, internet cowboys, right? That's not the same in other verticals. You go into REI that, you know, they're kind of all over the place, not to pick on REI or Bass Pro Shops. You know, they, they're kind of all over the place, but with fly shops, specialty fly shops, those guys, those associates know just as much as you do. That's right. Who who are the internet? You said internet cowboys. Like who, what is that person to you? I, I think a lot of, so you see a lot of product review. So I'll, I'll use you know, the gun industry, for example, right? You know, if, if I'm looking for a personal concealed carry gun, whatever, you know, um, then I'm going to go look online. I see all of these reviews, you know, Hickok 45, you know. Uh, yeah, some some YouTube influencer who's got a million uh, followers or whatever, and he's he's the man, but he doesn't have, he's just an online, he's a he's an internet cowboy. That's correct. And so, well, and a lot of the, so then, there, then there's the misinformation, right? There's the guys who just kind of, kind of come in and say, oh, I found this, there's something wrong with this. And I'm, I'm really purposely staying away from uh, identifying any fly fishing guys, because I think that we have the ability to kind of grow that at space. Right. Um, and as, as people learn, um, you know, more about fly fishing, these, a lot of these guys are being just bold and courageous and putting themselves out there um, and and saying, hey, you know, I'm going to test this out. It's it's easy for a lot of guys to hide behind a moniker and, and knock these people down. But, hey, you know, if you don't like what you see, go put your own video up there, you know. And I think there's a lot of content that's up there that can be better. And I think they're listening to that. But it's a, I think it's I think YouTube is a is a is a space now that 
like I said before earlier, that you can find out anything about anywhere. And, um, yeah, YouTube's great. You know, YouTube's great. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that's the, the power. I think I'm not, I don't know all the industries that well in the outdoor space, but the fly shop definitely is one of our things that just, you know, it just resonates with pretty much everybody. Even if you're an online person, you can't deny the fact that everybody knows, you know, the fly shops are like the number one, you know, that's like our bread and butter. And I grew up as a kid in a, in a little local fly shop. So it's like, it's always got a little, you know, personal thing for me as well. So, so cool, Ken. Well, I think this is, we've dug into it a little bit and, um, you know, I think if they have questions for you, we can send everybody out just to, uh, I guess, afta.com, uh, to connect. After, after.org. Or sorry. Yep. That's right. After.org. Yep. Perfect. And if they want to reach out to me again, it's IFTD at after.org. L- let me give you two little quick rapid fire one before we get out of here. Um, I'm not sure if you have a trip, uh, like a bucket list, like a lodge or a trip that you are planning. I mean, once we get out of COVID, maybe anything that comes to mind, like that one trip you got to do. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I love, I love Montana and, you know, my wife and I went, um, back in September and, and spent some time with Ben and Bozeman. And, uh, we, we fished up in Buffalo Creek and in Jackson hole. And, and, you know, I just, I love, I've been saltwater fishing for the better part of the last 20 years. And a lot of that's been with fly. Oh, conventional, but, but with some with fly. And, um, I love the keys, you know, I don't necessarily have a bucket list. I think mirror machines on everybody's like those kinds of bucket lists, but, um, yeah, I just, I mean, I just, I love it. I mean, I fish, you know, Monomoy, I mean, I've fished You've a lot that. of great places. You've... Yeah. It's just fun. I just like to go fish and I'd love to catch big fish, um, target fish and sight fish. So, um, yeah, that's those awesome. Are great. Right on, right on. And, and the final one is on music where we've got a little, uh, a wet fly swig, uh, podcast uh, channel on Spotify. Do you have a, a band or type of music that you want to give a shout out to that you like listen to? Uh, I really kind of grew up in the nineties. And so, um, widespread panic has always been my band. Oh, nice. Uh, you know, yeah, I've been all through college and high school, well, late high school, um, and then, um, college, but yeah. Does widespread panic have a, like a one song that the general public would know of? Like, is there, was there a big hit? Cause I know of them, but I just can't think of a, are they, they were kind of like a jam band, right? A little bit. Yeah, there's still a jam. It's another rock jam band. I mean, they they cover some some classics. I mean, there's there's some great music. Yeah, I I I'll probably get torched for saying anything yeah. from your class. Okay, yeah, yeah. We'll leave it. I'll, I'll just put like, <laughs> I, I I don't know that they 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 they've definitely had some music play on the on top 40 sure. at one point, but yeah, they're more it's like kind of straight yeah. away from that. They're more like yeah. the dead, a cool band that's just yeah, and all those. So I'll I'll put a link out to wetflyswing.com slash music and uh, we can listen. We're we're building up this channel from uh uh you know from shows that we've had, so we'll add the widespread panic to that uh, that playlist. Awesome. Cool, Ken. Well, hey, thanks again for taking the time, and I'll look forward to hopefully catching you here in uh, Salt Lake and uh, looking forward to getting the word out for everybody. And, yeah, thanks again for uh, hanging around today. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot for having me. Look forward to catching you in Salt Lake. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links, and everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 252, 252. Please take a quick moment and click subscribe if you've uh, been enjoying the show and want to get that next episode delivered right to your inbox. And uh, we have that episode coming. Uh, Tuesday is Russ Madden. Russ Madden is here to break down uh, streamers. Uh, He's out in the Midwest and is one of the most well-known streamers. Um, Take this one back to that old Kelly Gallup episode and him uh, and Kelly. uh, We hear the story about how they worked together in the past and We hear Russ's passion. We dig a little bit into salmon and steelhead and some other stuff there. So please click uh, subscribe and you'll get that uh, delivered right to your phone uh, Tuesday morning, first thing when that goes live. I want to thank you again and hope uh, you're having a good day wherever you are and hope to maybe talk to you uh, or see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.